Hi, everyone, and welcome to this Salt and Light Gathering on Moving Beyond a Life on Hold, Young Catholics in a Time of Crisis. This is hosted by our initiative on Catholic social thought and public life here at Georgetown University. My name is Kim Daniels, and I'm the Associate Director of the initiative. Um, and this is the third online dialogue that we've held since the beginning of the crisis. Um, we've talked about uh, our Catholic social thought principles and how they impact um, and can help us lead to a response to the crisis. And we've talked about the economic impacts of the crisis as well. Um, this is part of our Salt and Light program, which focuses on reaching young people in particular. First, I'd like to do some housekeeping. I'd like to thank you for joining us on our initiative's website via YouTube Live. This conversation will be recorded and posted on our website and social media so that you can view it later and your friends can too. Um, please share your thoughts on our discussion at the hashtag CST coronavirus and by tagging the initiative on Twitter at GUCST Public Life. And please submit questions on the dialogue for our panelists at cathsocialthought at georgetown.edu. Because this program is part of our Salt and Light program, we will be uh, taking questions from young people in particular, and those are the ones we'll go to first. Finally, if you have any questions or problems, please reach out to my wonderful colleague, Anna Misla, at anna.misla at georgetown.edu. We want to thank Georgetown School of Continuing Studies and the Office of Mission and Ministry for co-sponsoring this discussion. And we'd also like to thank our partners at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, Optimum Audio, and AI Media for helping us with the technical side of things. And now I'd love to get started. Um, let me first tell you a little bit about the wonderful group that we have assembled here today. Tara Isabella Burton is the author of Strange Rights, New Religions for a Godless World, which will be out on June 16th from Public Affairs, and of the novel Social Creature. She's a columnist at Religion News Service and a contributing editor at The American Interest. Kim Mazik is a leader at Catholic Charities USA as the Senior Manager for Engagement and Educational Outreach, and she's also a Georgetown graduate. Ashley McKinless is an award-winning associate editor at American Media. She edits the publication's Faith in Focus section and co-hosts Jesuitical, which is a podcast for young Catholics. And finally, Darius Villalobos is the director of Diversity and Inclusion at the National Federation for Catholic Youth Ministry, and he also advises the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops on Young Adult Ministry. And as for us here at the initiative, as I mentioned, we've already held one discussion on the principles of Catholic social thought and the crisis, and we've held another on the economic impacts of the crisis. We knew we wanted to do more, and Pope Francis pointed us in the right direction. In his recent interview with Austin Ivory at Commonweal, Pope Francis reminded us of the importance of getting the perspective of young people. He said, the elderly continue to be our roots, and any tension between the young and the old must be resolved with encounter and engagement. Because the young person is but in foliage and without roots, they cannot bear fruit. What would I say to young people, he said? You have the courage to look ahead and to be prophetic. May the dreams of the old correspond to your prophecies. Ashley, let's start with you and your reaction to that. You're an editor at American Media. You help lead Jesuitical, which is this wonderful podcast for young Catholics. And you and your colleagues have done just a number of episodes on the coronavirus crisis and given it wonderful coverage. I'd love to get your reaction to Pope Francis's comments and also to hear what you've learned from your efforts at Jesuitical, how young Catholics are reacting to the crisis, and what resources do our Catholic faith and teachings and experience offer to help shape a response. Yeah, so thank you so much for having me here, uh, Kim in Georgetown. Um, Pope Francis always has the right thing to say. I love when he talks to young people. It never feels like he's pandering to us and saying what we want to hear. It's often challenging and reminding us that, yes, the church relies on our on our energy and new ideas, but the, that we should be rooted in tradition and looking to our elders. Um, so uh, Jesuitical, the podcast that I hope host for American Media is geared towards um, younger Catholics. Um, and when we started the podcast, we had this idea that there were probably young Catholics out there who maybe went to Catholic University or did Jesuit Volunteer Corps and maybe have moved to a new city or back to their hometown and are hungry for a, a Catholic community that they might have had on campus. Um, and working at America, I was lucky to have um, 
young Catholic colleagues that, you know, we would find ourselves at the bar after work talking about Pope Francis. And we thought we could bring that that community to a wider audience with this podcast. And with the coronavirus pandemic, um, we're no longer at, at bars and no one has a physical parish community any, community anymore. Um, so we really saw this as a time to to double down on building that that um, virtual community that we had started with the podcast. Um, and what I found is there's a huge hunger for for information. So you know, in the weeks since um, the pandemic started, uh, we've talked to you know a bishop about the decision to cancel public masses and what goes into that, um, and and what priests are trying to do to stay connected with their parishioners. Um, we've talked to a historian of religion and uh, medicine about what the Catholic Church today could learn about the church's response to the Black Death um, and the parallels uh, there. Um, we've talked to the doctor who treated the first coronavirus patient in Seattle. Um, and so just, I don't know, I certainly can't get enough <laughs> information. It's one way to kind of deal with anxiety. So we've tried to bring that to our listeners. Um, we've also stepped up our efforts to build our community through our Facebook group. Um, I feel like especially in the first couple of weeks, people were just kind of like fumbling around trying to figure out, you know, like how to do a live stream mass in a way that didn't feel weird. <laughs> um, so, you know, we, we asked people to send, send pictures of their like home altars um, and things like that. And we got, you know, people were giving each other advice for the best place or, you know, some of their favorite places for a live stream mass or other prayer practices that are in our Catholic tradition that, that don't require um, a priest in the sacraments. Um, so that's a little bit of what we've been doing in the past couple of weeks. That's wonderful. And that's a lot, of course. Uh, you all have been a real resource, I know, for a lot of people. Um, Tara, let's turn to you. Uh, you have had quite a unique response, I think, to the coronavirus crisis. You wrote a column of, a couple weeks ago at a religious news service talking about the fact that you and your now husband eloped to Central Park and got married uh, with a priest and witnesses standing six feet away. Um, tell us a little bit about what led you to that decision and your experience and also what you learned about relationship and community and all the rest. Sure, yes. Well, um, so it was a bit of a, a bit of a surprise to both of us uh, and that we'd, we'd been planning to do it um, quite a bit later in the spring. Um, and we'd uh, sort of gotten a, a license just in case because we weren't 100% sure that the marriage bureau would remain open. But uh, obviously when the restrictions came into place, it uh, looked like that wasn't going to happen. And then with 20 hours notice, we realized that we could do it in Central Park, but old, but before I think it was Sunday night that we all gatherings were banned. So we we texted our priest and said, "Would you?" And he and he, he texts back and says, "What time?" And we're like, "Great, we'll do this." So we we got it together. Um, and what was so striking, I found, is um, you know, we planned something really small anyway. You know, two two witnesses and our priest was was always what we'd envisioned. Um, what we hadn't expected was. And of course, of course, it was a beautiful day, and it was the last day that before the shelter in place went into effect. How many people were out in the park, and people did stomp, and which was a bit unnerving because you could kind of want them to be six feet away from each other as well as from from us. But there was such a sense of um, of community in that sort of all of these New Yorkers were, were you know determined to to be present, and when. Uh, the community, which was we thought would be to be the witnesses, asked, "You know, will you support this couple?" Half of New York is shouting, "I will!" And it was uh, it was extremely moving. Um, we uh, we'd, we'd have joggers coming by, and you know, typical New York, like they'd been clapping, but they wouldn't break their stride and you know wouldn't wouldn't slow down for a second. And it was just this marvelous reminder that how enmeshed we are um, as a community in one another's lives, and that. That's simply because we don't necessarily have um, a, a personal relationship that we know about with people in our community. We, we are not necessarily um, conscious of it all the time. We are, there's always my, my favorite quote that I will always uh, bring back, which is uh, from the Brothers Karamazov, that we are all responsible to one another for everything. And in a time where we are so conscious of what it means to be responsible to one another, um, 
not just in the sense of, of the people that we know or people that we recognize, but the individuals, as opposed to just sort of a generic people, but individuals who we may never meet, people whose lives may be saved because we stay at home. Um, that sense of what community meant was, was all the more palpable. And then the sort of flip side of that was uh, you know, an hour later when we were back home and we got on Zoom to tell uh, family and friends what had just happened, I, I was struck again by the way in which um, what, what digital presence was and how ambiguous a space that was because it did feel real. It felt no less real to, to have my best friend or my mom on the call and, and uh, video chat her than it, than it did. I mean, maybe there, it wasn't exactly the same thing as her being in the room with us, but it was still palpable. And it made me curious what the, uh, what, what the line is between the authentic digital body, who we really are online and how we correspond with others online or through video chats and uh, the sort of stereotype that, that an online life is artificial or virtual. And so that's something that I've been thinking more and more about is what the authentic digital body looks like. It's fascinating, right? What we are shifting, we're shifting community from this real physical space to this virtual space and what that can look like. Both you and Ashley have talked about community and the idea of being responsible to one another and how we can do that. Darius, I'd love to turn to you now because your organization and your work really focuses on helping young people come together, accompany them as they try to be Christian witnesses in everyday life. And that's a lot about building community. Um, how can young people best live this out at this time during this crisis when in many ways we're confined to our homes? What's it look like to live out a faithful and principled witness? And in particular, I'd love you to focus a little bit on how the crisis is disproportionately affecting people at the margins, young people at the margins. Sure. No, uh, again, thank you so much. And thank you for the previous comments. I'll just build off of some of those ideas that um, a lot of what we've been trying to do is support young people and those who are accompanying young people in their everyday life and those who are particularly in ministry work. Um, one of the realities is just um, we have to do what was is within our means. And I think that's something that's really hard to discern right now. Um, I think a lot of people feel really uh, helpless. Uh, and very disempowered um, by not being able to do much. And yet we know that there are many young people who are out at the front lines um, supporting, caring for others, uh, being first responders, working in the healthcare system. Um, and then there's a lot of us who are at home and some of us are finding ways to stay busy through work. Uh, but realistically, a lot of us are having to be present through our relationships and through checking in on those we care about and those we know. Um, I think one of the best witnesses that we have is the going back to just the basics of personal relationships, calling people, texting people, checking in on those that we love and care for, but also those that we know that are struggling. Um, you know, the elderly may not find it as easy to jump online for a Zoom call, um, but an old-fashioned phone call can go a long way. Um, we've had many young people who are writing letters to people in their neighborhood, to um, their teachers, to um, just folks that they know maybe are feeling disconnected, um, those who are feeling uh, abandoned or left alone. Um, we've heard a lot about people who feel uh, a particular loss right now because of the lack of the sacraments and the lack of ability to connect in community. And so how do, can we stretch ourselves to go outside of what we're comfortable with um, and meet people where they're at? Um, that's such an important part of, uh, I think, something Pope Francis calls us all to. But I think especially young people have a unique role in this. Um, and then I think also... Uh, looking at ways that we can give back, um, ways that we can help. I find a lot of young adults have stepped up as, in some cases, the most essential person in the parish staff as they've been helping get live streams going, helping father figure out how to manage social media, um, how to reach out to other folks and send a mass email. Um, it seems so basic, and yet we can't assume that everybody has the level of comfort that some of us do with this technology. Um, and I think we have to be really conscious that there are a lot of people who don't have access to the technology and the gifts that we have. Um, vast majority of people are not uh, able to reach folks by internet, do these kind of calls. And so I think um, we have to be really mindful. There are a lot of people who are struggling um, and, as you mentioned, disproportionately um, feeling the effects of this virus, both health-wise, physically, uh, and economically. And so part of our witness is to be really conscious of those that are in need, 
uh, pray for them, but also to highlight the needs that they have. Um, social media is a great place to share information, but it also means we have to be responsible um, in using our social media and being generous to people uh, and being mindful that uh, words do matter, especially right now when uh, a lot of where people are accessing their information is through those accounts and through um, those platforms. Um, so there's a lot of work that young people can do in lifting up uh, others and being present to others, but a lot of it comes down to that personal care and relationship that we all have to start with in the very beginning. Thanks so much for that. I think it's so important to talk about the fact that so many people are out there struggling and can't be on a call like this and can't as much as we want to give back. Um, there are so many who who need to who ask us that question, and this is a great place to turn to you, Kim Mazik. How we can turn, how we can give back. You're a leader at, at Catholic Charities USA. And when I think of uh, the organization that's really on the front lines for us, for all of us in the Catholic Church, it's, it's Catholic Charities USA is certainly one of those at the forefront of that. Tara talked about being responsible for one another. Darius talked about giving back. You all are showing us how to do that every day. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, what you all are doing on the front lines, how young people might be able to help out with that, even when we're stuck, even when they're stuck at home, um, and just hear more about your work. Sure, sure. Well, again, thanks for the opportunity. And it's really nice to build on what everybody else has said, because it's, we are all connected in ways that we don't think that we're on. And I know this is um, it's an uncertain time for all of us. Um, it's, it's, we, we're all trying to figure it out as we go. And in what I've been most um, impressed in just, you know, honored, I mean, I work at Catholic Charities USA, but I think about the different Catholic Charities agencies around the country who are seeing much more requests for food, um, trying to figure out how to provide more shelter for people who are, and, and new ways of, of building shelter for people. How do we have people six feet apart in a shelter? How do we make sure that uh, families that don't have childcare, who are, as we talk about um, the disparities, uh, families that are still going to work, as many of us stay at home, but families that may not have access to childcare, how do we give them the resources and take care of them in those ways? And so across the country, Catholic Charities are responding in amazing ways working with farmers to uh, take food that may have been left in a field um, to, to rot, but how do we get that to a food bank? How, the, how do we get that to a place that used to conduct congregate dining and make sure that gets to families? We've had to change a little bit of our operations. Um, we're very um, sensitive to making sure people can make those choices themselves, but now we're doing a lot, as you've seen on television, where people can drive up and pick up meals. That's a lot of things that Catholic Charities have been involved in. Um, so as much as we're seeing service happen across the country, it is um, unfortunately on hi highlighting just uh, the sense of inequality. And for us, it gives me the reflection, on how do we think about solidarity? How do we think about being in community with each other? And so when I especially think about young people and I think people who, you know, expected to finish out the semester at school and may have had to come home from college, that's different. That's unusual. Um, and I also know that that's, that's not the case for some they're finding, you know, also looking for shelter. Um, two uh, organizations that are still trying to find ways for young people to work, All for Good, and um, I've shared these links so they'll pop up somewhere in the feed. Um, Allforgood.org um, has ways for people to volunteer and do service remotely. Um, so even if you think there's no way for you to volunteer, there's no way for you to use your voice, we've talked this matter in social media already, I've mentioned it. There are organizations that can use your help if you if you have those skills or you're a good writer, this is an opportunity to, to do that. Um, MyAmericorps.gov also still is looking for service opportunities and it might be something that's down the road. I know that I've talked to two students who are graduating in this time and it also feels very uncertain to them as they expected to have commencement exercises and those things. But um, and job opportunities may or may not be where they were, but consider a year of service. There are lots of service organizations and they still might be providing placement um, towards the end of this calendar year. So it's not all um, for naught. Um, there are also opportunities to volunteer in, in person. And I want to be very cautious here uh, about who you are sheltering in place with. If someone has a vulnerability, I want you to really think about this carefully if it makes sense. But some of our agencies are looking for volunteers because as we see people being impacted, if they're out on the front lines, we can use volunteers. So um, you can also look for the local Catholic charities in your area and see if they have use of volunteers. 
and know that most volunteering is happening in, in a space of 14 days. So you may volunteer for 14 days, and then after that, you'll take a break for 14 days to make sure that you're not exhibiting any signs of COVID-19. But there are opportunities, both remotely and in person. But again, if you're living at home with your parents who may have heart disease or diabetes or any of those underlying conditions that we've all heard about on the news, I would, I would ask you to really think and be prayerful about whether that's the best choice for you to do. But again, also making sure your neighbors are really informed um, to make sure that if people are exhibiting signs, find out where testing is, make sure you can go there. Uh, blood banks are taking donations of blood and plasma. That's something you can still do. They're trying to do that in a way that's very safe and won't expose you. And the final thing, I'm on the social policy team at Catholic Charities USA. And so we have been monitoring all this legislation that's trying to provide relief to small businesses, trying to make sure that healthcare workers have all the protective um, prepared gear that they need, you can be an advocate. Um, this is a perfect time to get on the phone, call your senators, call your representatives, let them know how you feel about these things. Um, you can also sign up to be a part of our advocacy network. We send out a newsletter every week and we've been really making sure we inform everyone about what the different pieces of the legislation are and how you can be involved. And this is a perfect time to use your voice. And members of Congress are um, taking calls and you can email them and be on the phone with them and even Zoom calls. We've done that as well with some of our members of Congress. So there's many ways to be engaged and involved and to not lose hope. We are a people of hope. Thanks so much for that. And obviously, this is a terrific way for us. I'm so glad that we have the opportunity here to think about how we can all help. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, how this has affected you all personally. And maybe, Ashley, I'll, I'll go to you first on this. Uh, I, you're a young person from New York. I believe I've listened to it, listening to Jesuitical that you're here in the D.C. area now, maybe. And um, I'd love to hear a little bit about how this has affected you personally, how your life has changed, um, and what you're hearing from Jesuitical listeners about how their lives have changed and what they're trying to do in shifting uh, to this new environment that we're in. Yeah, so um, last month, my sister had her first child, so I became an aunt, and it was on March 11th, the, the day the World Health Organization declared coronavirus a, a worldwide uh, pandemic. Um, and so I had, at that point, I really, like a lot of Americans, I didn't really see it as a very near threat, and I was focused on this beautiful new life that was in the world. Um, and then it quickly became apparent that, like, everything was going to change. I um, I was back in New York the Sunday that the archdiocese canceled all the masses. Um, and then the shelter in place order came. And, you know, like a lot of New Yorkers, I do not have a lot of space <laughs> in my Brooklyn studio. So um, I did make the decision to, to ride out the lockdown um, with my parents and uh, the DC area. Um, and that came with its own, its own challenges. My 93 year old grandfather is also staying with us at this time. So I was, you know, very concerned coming from the hotspot of, of the, um, pandemic in the United States to living with him. So there was, you know, two weeks where I was social distancing within my own home. Um, and, but also becoming very aware of, uh, like, and Darius and everyone has mentioned, you know, our, our connection to one another. Um, as a young person, I might not be all that vulnerable to uh, the worst effects of the disease, but I was um, worried about my newborn niece and my and my grandfather. So, you know, just being very aware of our interconnectedness. Um, so, yeah, and. Uh, like a lot of people, one thing I heard from the Jesuitical community was this desire to like help when you can't leave your house. Um, and so I'm so grateful to Kimberly for giving all those resources. Um, but one thing we did talk about was, you know, you know, even if you can't help people outside your home, really being present to the people you're with uh, is something you do have control over. And so that's one thing you know, in my own life, I've been thinking a lot about. So it's one thing to <laughs> say how much I want to, you know, help people and visit the sick and feed the hungry. It, but, you know, it's a lot harder sometimes to be patient with my grandfather and my parents while I'm living at home. And so that's one thing I've been uh, thinking a lot about. And something that I've heard from Jesuitical listeners is, you know, what do you, what can you do? What do you have control over? 
Um, and so we've, we've had those conversations on our, on our Facebook page. Um, and, and, you know, I get so much, out, you know, I don't want to sound like we're just providing this great resource. I get a lot from our listeners, um, you know, whether it's uh, prayer practices or, um, you know, even just like a funny meme to <laughs> brighten your mood on one of these these days where you lose track of time. Uh, so, yeah, no, it's been an interesting time. <laughs> That's definitely true. Uh, Darius, let's go to you. Tell us about where you are, what you're doing, and how those you work with are, are reacting, your family, your friends as well. So I'm in Chicago, um, which is where I was born and raised. Um, I live in a three flat with my wife and my brother-in-law is staying with us uh, in the midst of this. He was originally just moved back from New York over the summer and I uh, was staying with my mother-in-law, uh, but because of her age and his work, uh, we decided to have him stay with us. Um, I can't say it's easy. Um, it's definitely hard, especially um, trying to be present to those people that you're with, but also um, I have to older parents who I'm constantly checking in on, doing grocery runs for, dropping things off. Um, and so I'm used to working from home. Um, I'm blessed in the work that I do that I actually get to uh, work remotely. But it's definitely a much different being in a space where now everybody else is kind of in the same boat with you. And we're all trying to figure out and manage how do we work together in this space? How do we uh, share the internet and not all be on video conferences all at the same time? Um, how do you accompany those who've not done this before? Um, for a lot of those that we serve and work with, um, ministry leaders, especially youth and young adult ministry leaders, this isn't how they're used to gathering. This isn't how they're comfortable um, sharing and accompanying people. And so providing them resources and support and guidance on how to do that is really, really important right now. One of the biggest challenges, I think, is that sense of loss, um, not just loss of work and uh, that feeling of, of security, but also the loss of loved ones um, or just acknowledging the loss that so many people are having right now can weigh very heavily on folks. And so the need for taking care of ourselves, um, our mental health, um, being able to uh, know where to get resources for your own sake. Um, we talk so much about the needs of supporting others, but so much of it starts with ourselves and our ability to acknowledge where we're at and where we're hurting and where we're broken. Um, it's so important to be a people of hope. Um, we're in the Easter season, and I know I definitely have moments where I don't feel like it's Easter. Uh, I feel like I'm somewhere between Holy Saturday and uh, Easter Sunday morning where I know the resurrection took place, but I, it ha I haven't heard the good news yet. I haven't felt that in myself and in my spirit. Um, and in those moments, I think it's so important to um, recognize that we're not alone and to be in connection with others. Uh, I personally have found a really wonderful community of young adults through uh, Commonweal. They have a number of young adult communities that they organize and support, and I, I support the one here in Chicago. Um, and those Monday gatherings have just been a real blessing for me um, to connect, um, to talk about, yes, our reality, but talk about other stuff too, um, church and society and politics, uh, and just be reminded that there's more to come, that this is not the end of the story. Um, you know, we're feeling that Good Friday moment, but uh, it ends with the resurrection. It doesn't end in death. That's right. This isn't the end of the story. I'm so glad uh, you put it that way and reminded us of that. Tara, we've been trying to talk a little bit about uh, the personal side of this. You wrote a terrific column recently about just this subject, about the idea that um, in this day and age, it, it feels like we're talking a lot about numbers and we're seeing people as numbers. It's a good day, you said, when 800, only 800 people die in New York, which of course is just so tragic and awful. Um, how do you think we can remember that people aren't just numbers and resist the throwaway culture that Pope Francis talks about in this kind of a time? Create um, something out of what you've called a crisis of particularity and turn our attention outward and not inward. I think attention is exactly the, the word I'd use, the sort of the very intentional practice of paying attention to other people as people. And I think this is something certainly that uh, predates this particular crisis, but the, the idea that we have gotten so used to as a culture thinking in terms of both numbers or people sort of at that scale, but also, um, as you said, the throwaway culture, the idea that, you know, we, 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 someone might 
get groceries delivered even before the pandemic or get in an Uber or hire a task rabbit or engage in all of these economic transactions with uh, anonymous uh, people or people who are treated as anonymous or not fully uh, individual. And I think that there is that tendency, which in many ways has been in some corners intensified by the fact that, you know, in staying at home, there is, you know, those of us who are, um, who are staying at home, who are getting groceries delivered, could so easily fall into that trap of, oh, great, these groceries magically appear on our doorstep and forget that there um, are essential workers. And even, even that, um, that term doesn't feel enough because, again, it is a generic term and not a particular one of saying this person who has come, this person who is, is working, this person who is on the front lines. And I think the best that we can do is to cultivate in every interaction we have, whether it's on the street, whether it's um, through political engagement or personal interaction uh, to, to remember what it means to be and to be in dialogue with a, a particular human being with a name, a history, a community around them. And, um, and I think it is, it is something that requires um, attention. It is a practice. It is a, is a, form of, I, I would say, call it a form of prayer or of worship or the love of God and the love of the neighbor. Um, but I do think that it's it's something that was already sort of profoundly absent in our culture up to now. And it's, it's not simply a crisis of the present moment, but a crisis that the present moment has made all the more clear. That feels like uh, what we're seeing right now is that uh, that crises and problems that are often under the radar and under the surface are coming to the forefront right now. I'm struck by uh, your mention of essential workers um, because I feel like right now we're seeing a lot of people who are essential workers who we didn't think of that way beforehand. And uh, Kim, I wonder if we might turn to you to talk a little bit about that shift in perspective. Um, and uh, certainly the folks who are manning uh, Catholic charities um, staffing it around the country are essential workers for us all right now. And I wonder how, not only how we can support them um, in practice personally, but also what kind of policies you all are advocating for that might help support those folks who are out there uh, on the front lines exposing themselves to this virus so that the rest of us uh, can be okay. Yeah, so I, I think it's really critical that as we look at legislation, we are constantly asking, um, you know, one of the big lifts was to get the money for the Small Business Association. That helps family businesses and other things stay in business. But the other piece was the protective equipment. Um, we want it, definitely want it for our healthcare workers and our first responders, but also what, what implements can we support for those working in soup kitchens, working, I mean, there's still a number of congregate dining places that are serving hot food to people across the country. So how do we make sure that protocols are followed so that they protect themselves and yet they still are serving in a way that we are all called to serve in a way that is very personal and very intentional. So um, just we continue to advocate for those things in legislation and we we're kind of getting it bit by bit. Um, we're hoping in the next phase of legislation that we'll make sure that there's more food available. Um, one of the things that we've advocated for that seems, you know, when you think about it, not so important, but if families that are, and that number of course is increasing, that now that they can order food online. So again, you know, we talk about who these essential workers are and the food magically appears, but a number of our brothers and sisters who are having to use SNAP if they're not working or things have changed or if they were before, and it, I don't mean to make, put any category on anybody, but if they're trying to access food for their, as an individual, as a senior or, um, or families, but think about those seniors and those family members that might have someone at home that they would benefit from not having to go out to the store. So if they could access uh, SNAP online. So that's increasing. We're hoping that will be available in more states and also what we can do to just leverage that funding so it can serve more people. Um, also making sure that um, healthcare workers, you know, are enabled to get what they need and, and continue to raise those voices for those people who we know are taking care of us either personally in body or to make sure that we're fed. Um, also, one last thing in terms of immigration is, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about our, our migrant farm workers and how they will be paid this season. And there's been talk about letting farmers pay them whatever they want. We still want a just wage for those people so that they can too take care of their families. Um, just because there is this great pandemic and crisis, that doesn't mean that we leverage it on the backs of families and decrease their ability to make a decent living so that they can take care of their families. It is, we are all the body of Christ and now we're having to think of it in slightly different ways. Um, and I'll 
what I just want to add personally, just because this was something that happened on Sunday, a group of friends gathered to have kind of a fun, silly moment. A friend had done a video that she wanted to share and what she did that was so beautiful. We've been friends for a number of years. She just began to call out all, all the names in her family, of all the first responders, all the people working in grocery stores, all the people that still had to leave their home every day. And when we sat down to dinner, I'm here with my parents. I came um, to Florida to be with them. They're both in their 80s. And I thought it was important to be here um, so that I could do the same thing that um, Darius is doing is running errands for older family members. But we sat down and we thought about um, my niece, who's a nurse and working on a floor, another uh, sister that a sister of mine who helps run the nursing education program. We just went through and just named all the people. And I think when we think about those people as individuals that we know, then we know that that circle is so much larger, that there are people working in grocery stores to make sure that we can eat. There are people who are making sure that uh, pharmaceutical drugs are delivered, all those things that we need that I think we do take for granted because we can just go pick it up or have it shipped to our home, but how people are taking care of us and may not know our names, how do we make sure that we're present to them as they um, offer a service to us? Thanks so much for that. I think it's so true. I have uh, so many friends who are nurses, and I think in the everyday uh, run of things, I doesn't I don't internalize the wonderful work that they're doing, and and certainly this time has made me uh, keep them in our prayers for sure. Um, but I also want to take this and talk maybe first to you, Ashley, and then to you, Tara, to talk about you talked about interacting with people on social media um, while we're physically isolated. And we've had one question come in. And just a reminder that if you have a question you'd like to ask us, we've had a number of them come in. One I'm going to focus on in a second. But if you have a question you'd like to ask us, email it to kathsocialthought at georgetown.edu. Um, this question comes from Jackson Wolford at the American Enterprise Institute. And he says, during this time of isolation, we have reason to be especially thankful for social media and also especially aware that it's no substitute for physical togetherness. What are some strategies for maximizing the good of social media, but also minimizing our exposure to the toxicity and polarization of it that so often comes up and also the anxiety it sometimes produces, especially in these times? Um, Ashley, you wanna take a stab at that and then maybe we'll go to you, Tara. Yeah, no, I, I think a lot about that, uh, being in charge of a Facebook community and trying to um, manage what's contributed and make sure that people are respectful um, and constructive and always um, uh, you know, offering their ideas in good faith. Um, and I would say, yes, we are, our, our reliance on social media in this time is making clear to a lot of people that it, it's not enough. Um, we, we sorely miss being physically present to one another. We sorely miss receiving the Eucharist in person. Um, so what I'm trying to do is, is use social media for, for what it's worth, um, for sharing resources, for praying for people who are far away from me, but also like, trying to hold on to that that hunger that it also elicits for the real thing um, and making sure that that's something I also carry on to when whatever comes next um, and, and acting on that. I feel like a lot of people right now have the sense that, you know, things are not going to be the same afterwards. And, and we're in the position to choose what the, the new normal looks like. Um, and so as wonderful as, you know, being able to connect over Zoom and Facebook um, has been, I I think, you know, what it's also a reminder of, of what we really want and maybe haven't valued enough in the past. Thanks. How about you, Tara? So I think temperamentally, I'm often a bit of a, an optimist about a digital the power of digital connection. Um, I, something that I have been so struck by in this time is, is how much more I'm seeing, particularly those friends of mine who don't live in New York or don't live in the States, um, than I, that I ever did. I have sort of standing Zoom dates. I, I went to college in the UK with my, you know, my old college friends whom I otherwise only really see when I'm visiting. And I'm, I'm struck that I think that there's a temptation that I often fall into is to think of, you know, there's, there's real life, which is physical embodied life. And then there is sort of, 
something else, that digital space that is either artificial or lesser. And yet I think to the extent that digital space is a manifestation of or a, a location of our social bonds to one another, to a desire for one another to connect, to talk, to interact, I think that that is, is, is still to be, to be present in, in giving attention to someone um, via a video chat, via writing a, a print letter, via texting, all of these mediums that sort of uh, demand and allow for our presence um, aren't necessarily lesser than a physical presence. And what I would say then um, is that the, the idea that there, there's certainly, as, as you said, the sort of the toxicity of social media, to me actually comes from a place of treating our online selves, our avatars as sufficiently removed from our real selves that it almost sort of doesn't matter, like the internet trolling irony of, well, it doesn't matter what I say, you know, if my avatar is really horrible and says horrible things to that person's avatar, it's not real. That sense of irony and remove. Um, rather than a sense of reality, I think is at the core of so much of um, internet vitriol. So to the extent that I think, do I think that physical, okay, I will of course do think that physical presence is preferable, but I don't think that digital presence is not real. And I would, I would advocate for, um, and I think that this is actually, again, beyond the scope of this pandemic, a question that we haven't necessarily answered theologically um, fully in the digital age. It's like, what does it mean to be present online? And what does that mean for who we are? And this, this, is, this is a rich field of questions that um, I hope we continue to discuss in the coming days and months and, and years. Thanks for that. And why don't I turn now to you, Darius, and then you, Kim. Um, we have a bunch of questions about prayer and prayer life. So what does that look like for you now? How has that changed? Sandy Nunez asks, do you have any recommendations for how young adults can grow in humility? Um, Andrew Condon, who's a Georgetown graduate student, says that, um, is there any way, you know, when we talk about the, you know, we miss the Eucharist, we miss the sacraments, um, and online is not quite the same thing. Is there any way we can showcase solidarity and unite um, unite ourselves in prayer. Is there anything going on uh, in the church that you all can point us to? Um, Darius, why don't you start us off? Sure. Um, so I'll make a shameless plug because I have my card here. I keep my examine card uh, on my desk, uh, though I was not a uh, Jesuit education uh, formed. I definitely uh, aspire to a lot of the uh, uh, Ignatian spirituality process and methods personally. Uh, and for me, I think I have really had to lean on uh, imaginative prayer as a way to both get me outside of the physical space that I'm confined to, um, but also to begin to put myself into other people's shoes um, and to put myself into um, just a different sense of the reality that I'm experiencing right now, because so much of it is uh, very cut off from the world. And so whether that's with scripture uh, or spiritual reading, I found that to be personally very um uplifting for me. Uh, I, I'll be honest, I really struggle with uh, online masses or streaming masses. Uh, it's just not the same for me. Uh, and I, I think I've recognized more so in this moment how important the community aspect of going to mass was for me. Um, you know, I love the, the ritual and the music and all the, the material pieces, but I think being present with other people I realized was so important to my experience of mass. Um, and I just don't find watching the mass online or on TV um, as a fulfilling prayer form. And so I've really had to, to find ways to uh, allow myself time to be with God, um, both with the, the good and the challenging parts of this experience, um, to allow myself to be vulnerable, to allow myself to be angry, um, and then to do that in spaces where I can share some of those things, to be vulnerable with folks. Uh, I think Tara said it really well. Um, the virtual me is as much of me as I put into it. And the question is, how authentic do I want to be in those experiences? Um, I could put an avatar and hide myself, or I can be who God has made me to be and be honest about both the, the gifts and the challenges that come with that. Um, and so finding ways that I can still be in community and pray in community, um, I think it's been challenging, but it's been such a good way to stretch myself um, and in that Ignatian sensibility to really find God in everything, um, both the things that bring me desolation and the things that bring me consolation. 
How about you, Kim? Yeah, I, I have to agree with Darius. It's it's um it's it's a very different time. And and um and the first time I was watching Mass online, I I I you know I got so kind of distracted by the angle of the camera and everything else, and I was like, am I really attending Mass? Um, the beauty of being home with my parents, who I've now spent more time with now since when I graduated from college, is um, my mother and I have sat down and um, have decided to uh, attend Mass together. So that at least, again, it, I think it is something either tactile about being with people, but at least being with somebody. Uh, but I have a group of friends who we, um, we, we normally have a meet prayer group, where, but we've been meeting online. And um, and we've been visiting and hearing about each other's family and children and whatever's going on. And um, each week we, when we meet, we, somebody is going to do, it's going to lead us in prayer. So we have a social conversation. And then at the end, whoever has been uh, picked to do prayer, and it has been an amazing combination and yet healing. Um, I'm going to reveal something now that I don't think anybody knows. Maybe some people who know me who are listening. At the beginning of this, my, I had a brother who'd been disabled, and he went into the hospital around the 4th or 5th of March and subsequently died on the 19th. So as all of this is beginning, um, so this has also been a time. Um, so on Easter morning, my sisters and my mother and I got up at the crack of dawn, and um, we had a very, very beautiful experience of going to the tomb. And so even though I know that we still feel like we're somewhere in between Good Friday and resurrection, um, that morning, I really had a moment. And um, so I just think there's also an opportunity to be more vulnerable, to be with our families in ways that we haven't been before, and to be open to that. Um, I think that for a lot of young people that thought that they were away from home for the rest of their lives, they're back at home again, and they're thinking, oh, what am I going to do? And I can't get out. I, I mean, we all, a lot of us like to get out. A lot of us are homebodies, but I, I guess I'm saying be innovative. Think of new ways to prayer. I mean, I, I keep thinking that um, a question I had for my nephew is like, why is all this happening? And I kept thinking, I don't have a good answer for that, but I think God is calling us inward and, um, and finding new ways to, to be with him, to find new ways to discover Christ, to, to find new ways to discover each other. And, you know, there are a lot of, families that are going through really painful things. And, and I keep thinking we were fortunate enough that my brother, when he passed, he, it's right before it really got locked down. So we were able to be with him when he died. But all these um, first line healthcare workers who are also holding the hands of our family members as they, as they pass to um, into death. And I just think, how do we also support them? And so that's why I think when my friend wanted to pray for all the healthcare workers to think they have a new role that they haven't had before. So how do we also support them and pray for them in ways because they're doing our work and they're doing God's work. I mean, they're ushering so many people from this life into the next life. And, and that can't be easy when your normal focus is blood pressure and blood sugars and all those other things. So um, I think we're all growing and trying to be um, innovative in new ways. And so when you said there was a question about growing in humility, I just think to, for us to be more present about how people are experiencing the world and their families and maybe people they don't know really well, how it's, how it's changed, but how, what that means for us as people and how we grow into that as church. I, I want to thank you so much for sharing that with all of us. And I know we're all going to be praying for your brother and for your family. And I think we just had a, you know, it, it's a real moment to remember what Easter was like for all of us, because it's such, obviously, it's just the core of our faith, and uh, and it was very different for all of us. Um, we have a great question pointing in this direction from Colleen Waldron, who says, um, you know, church is, uh, it's not just a building, right? That it's something beyond that. We're all living out, uh, we're all living out our faith, um, and we are being the church when we are serving, and we are mourning, and we are praying, and all the rest that we do at home. Um, I wonder, uh, just whoever would like to take this first, what is it like, how are we living out that um, idea of church not just being in a building? How are you doing it? How did you do it on Easter? Um, how can we do it in the future? Um, and does anybody want to start us off, Darius? Um, I've had a really unique experience of parish life since this started. Um, my pastor is originally from Kenya and had gone to Kenya to visit his uh, family because his brother was getting married. Well, he never made it back from Kenya. Uh, he's still there. All the, the lockdown happened while he was still in transit. And so our 
our parish has been without a priest basically since this has started. And being on the parish council, the first question they ask is like, what do we do? Um, and so in so many ways, it's really stretched us to think creatively about how to be church outside of church, those four walls. Um, the most consistent thing I have found is that desire and that need for being connected and being present. Um, I have found for myself, you know, the staff is overwhelmed, stressed. They're worried about so many things that are happening. Um, and yet they are still going out of their way to reach out to people, to families, to be with them during their time of need, to comfort them. And so how do we take care of them? And so I've, I've really asked our parish council team to say, you know, can we check in on the staff? How can we make it easier for them? How can we spread the load? And, and the funny thing is the most basic things that we go back to, it's doing a phone tree, um, calling parishioners and checking in and finding out how they're doing and what they need. Um, it seems so small, and yet it has made such the difference to feeling like we're connected to community. Um, and then I, I don't believe in coincidences. I think God definitely is giving us an opportunity when this started. Uh, we were in the middle of Lent. Uh, so many of us were saying we we're struggling with you know, praying and quiet and how do we be introspective during this time? And now we none of us have a choice. <laughs> and I think in so many ways, it allows us to lean into the liturgical life of the church, the, the beauty that comes with those daily readings, the beauty that comes with recognizing the seasons and the movements that we go through uh, and allowing the Lord to speak to us in a real intentional way. Uh, and so I've, I've really appreciated um, how this has forced me to just go outside of my comfort zone of what I feel like my role is as church, as just the parishioner, uh, and accompany people in a more intentional and a very different way. Thanks so much for that, Darius. And uh, I want to I want to see if any of you want to complete that and think about that, but also want to throw one other thing out there, one other great question we're getting. You've talked about, Darius, you talked about connection. We've all talked about community and relationship. Um, somebody asked, and I think it's a great question, given that social distancing is going to be around for a while, regardless of what happens, and that personal interconnection is so important to young people, um, small groups and just getting together with a couple of friends and all the rest. How do you see young people getting together after this? How do you see them keeping that connection, that sense of connection when we still have to keep social distancing? But also talk a little bit more, anybody who wants to build on our, our earlier question as well. Ashley, you want to jump in? Sure. Uh, so a few weeks ago, I was asked to join the, or to start co-chairing the adult formation committee at my parish in Brooklyn. Um, so I went to my first meeting for that last week, even though I'm now in DC. And, you know, it started kind of talking about business as usual, like, okay, so what's the program going to be for the next calendar year? Like, what, what date do we want to start the small faith group sharing in the fall? And then the pastor just had to jump in and be like, you guys, nothing is going to be the same for the next year and maybe ever again. And we need to, as a church, adapt to that reality. Um, and so we kind of took this as like a, a wake up call that, you know, there at a lot of parishes, there are the people who are, you know, very deeply involved and then kind of everyone else who, you know, shows up to mass on Sunday. And if we're not going to be gathering for mass on Sunday, what does it mean to be church to those people? And what, what can we do? And I don't, my, what I took from the, the meeting was that, you know, we, we don't know, we need to, we need to become the listening church that Pope Francis has been calling for since the beginning of his papacy, because, um, what that church looks for looks like for an elderly person who may not feel comfortable coming into a physical church for the next couple of years or receiving um, the precious blood is going to be different than what it looks like for young people who are still um, hungry for and maybe a little bit more capable of coming into physical community again. So yeah, it, so the outcome was like we we need to listen to people, um, which <laughs> it, it you know it, it's not great that it took a crisis for <laughs> for the church to really realize that like the status quo wasn't working for everyone. But I do see that um, that as an opportunity going forward. 
it really is a moment uh, of, you know, of change and of awareness, I think, for all of us of, of what's happening and how we should be living our lives all the time, not just in this time. Um, we're getting questions, just wonderful questions, and I wish we could answer all of them. They're from all over the world. I have a question here from Argentina, from people all over the country. Um, I think this is a, a really important one. And again, uh, please feel free, all of you, to talk to um, any questions that have come up. And, and Tara, I wonder if we might go to you. Um, someone asked, just to start this question, how we deal with all of this loss and uncertainty, um, sometimes really profound and sometimes ordinary. Um, how is it, how can we in our individual lives, when we're away from others, when we're away from the sacraments and all the rest and mass, how do we deal with, um, we've lost our normal rituals and our normal um, closeness, ways of becoming close to others. So how do we deal with uncertainty and with loss, ordinary and extraordinary? I think I, I can only answer that from a Christian perspective. But just, but, but I think that that is exactly the, I mean, in my understanding of what the resurrection is, and I, I do, it, what, what, what it was then and is now is the promise of, of, of hope, not only in the sense that that which we hope might come to pass will come to pass, but something so much more profound, which is that the way in which things are reconciled and, and mountains are made low and valleys are made high and all of this um, happens is beyond our capacity to, to reason, to fit into our own narratives, our structures of cognition. And I think that the way in which I understand the hope of the resurrection is, is the, um, I always think about Peggy Lee song, but that it, this is not all there is, um, that the, the, the way in which consolation comes is itself, um, it, it's not just everything's going to be okay, everything's going to go back to normal, the status quo is going to resolve itself, but that there is something so much greater um, I won't even say in store for us because that is a personal understanding of, of, of the narrative, but that simply um, that existence is meaningful in that way. And I think, I think that's, I mean, that is what the faith of, of the resurrection that where else would you have it, but in uh, the sense of, of darkness and crisis. Thanks so much for that. Um, and thanks to all of you. And uh, as we come to the end of our time together here, I wonder if we might uh, go around the group and have one takeaway, one sign of hope. What do you what do you see from this conversation? What have you learned? What are you going to take away from it? You've talked about community and our responsibilities to one another. We've talked about loss. We've talked about the difference between the, the physical and the virtual world. And most of all, we're talking to young people and we're saying, you know, what does this mean? What does this crisis mean for young people and how can um, they best respond? Um, Kim, I wonder if we might start with you to answer that question and then just go around uh, just to wrap this up today. Sure, sure. The thought I was thinking about, is, especially as we're thinking about young people and kind of, um, I think even Tara even said something about the status quo and how to, what we think about when returning. So the thought that I have as we're kind of finishing up is um, those that aren't with us, you know, those who can't, who can't be with us because of lack of access to Wi-Fi. They don't have a laptop. They don't have a computer or their phone and connectivity. How do we think about, when we think about the status quo or this new normal, how do we make sure that it's more inclusive, that when we start thinking about the impact that COVID-19 has had in our communities, that we start really thinking innovatively as church, what that means for our communities. How do we grow and make it better? And I, I'm inviting all of us in, in this opportunity is to think, well, the, the normal wasn't working. So when that new normal comes about, how do we make sure that it's more beneficial to more people, to a larger community, to all of our brothers and sisters? And I think it's there. I mean, I'm, I'm putting out the challenge, not just for young people, but for myself, for all of us to say, how do, how do we do things differently so that this doesn't have the same impact, especially in communities of color? Thanks so much, Kim. Um, Ashley, how about you? How do we do things differently? What are you thinking from this conversation? What are you taking away? I, I think back to a moment that will stick out from this crisis for me is when Pope Francis gave a blessing on the city and the world from a empty St. Peter's Square. Um, it was raining, it was very dramatic. And 
you know, at this time, a lot of people, young people included, are asking, like, why? Like, why would a good God let this happen? And Pope Francis's answer was like, this is not God's judgment on the world. It's it's about our judgment. It's about what we choose to do in this moment. And I think for young people um, in particular, there's, um, you know, there is a bit of restlessness, a bit of um, unhappiness with what how the church functions now sometimes they feel excluded like their parish is not listening to them and I think that one of the offshoots of this crisis crises is that churches are out of necessity going to where young people are they're <laughs> they if they weren't on Facebook before they are now if they didn't have a live stream before they are now um, and and they need young people's help to utilize those tools effectively so if <laughs> if you're stuck at home and wondering how you can help that that's a great place to start with your own parish community because this this is going to fundamentally change how how we function as church. Thanks, Ashley. Darius, how about yourself? What are you taking away from our conversation today? I think the key thing that I'm going to be reminded of is um, we all come with our own realities, our own baggage um, into this situation, and we have a lot to wrestle with, but the necessity for all of us to be honest and open and authentic about where we're at in the situation, um, to allow, allow grace to work in this moment, um, to be open to the fact that very few of us have answers <laughs> to all of the tough questions that we're asking, but uh, we're all in this together. And yet in the midst of a lot of heartache, a lot of loss, a lot of grieving, um, we are still called to be people of great hope um, we're called to be an Easter people, um, even if it doesn't always feel that way. Um, but that there's a lot of opportunity here for us to grow. And so uh, for myself, uh, whether you are an essential worker or you know stuck at home, um, using this opportunity to really ask that question, you know, where's where's God working in this, and where is God calling me to? Uh, I think back to Pope Francis's words um, not too long ago. This is not the uh, an era of change. This is a change of an era. And none of us know where the world's going to look um, months from now, let alone years from now. Um, so let's be open to where the spirit leads us. Thank you so much, Darius. Tara, let's end with you. And uh, first, let me use this opportunity to say congratulations again on your marriage. Um, what are you going to take away uh, from our conversation here today? Um, and, and what do you want to leave um, our uh, viewers with? I think that something that we've all touched on in, in different ways is the, the absolute vitality of presence. However, we can conceive that even in the absence of physical presence in community. And such a vital part of that is, is vulnerability, not um, the sort of authenticity that has itself become its own brand now. You know, to be authentic is, is somehow marketable, but to be truly vulnerable with one another um, it is a calling, and of course, it's it's impossible to uh, to talk about that as an ethical or, or moral imperative without sort of thinking of that in in the context of the the model we have in Christ, which is you know we do not worship a God who is simply a sovereign and vulnerable King, but also a God who was made man, who was vulnerable, who did suffer, and who did die. And I think and yes, of course, and of course, we cannot say and who came back to life and both of those things are so vital. But I think that as we chart um, a moral course forward, I think that we can't lose sight of the vulnerability of Christ as a model for um, how we should be in our own lives with one another. Thank you so much. And I just want to take this moment to thank our wonderful panel. What a terrific discussion this was. And thank all of you for joining us here for this online salt and light gathering. It's a reminder to let your friends know that the recording of this will be available on our website and on our social media channels. Um, I want to thank the School of Continuing Studies at Georgetown and the Office of Mission and Ministry as well for co-sponsoring our gathering here. Uh, and also our partners at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs. Op 
Optimum Audio and AI Media for helping us on the back end with all the technical uh, things that go on behind the scenes. Most of all, I want to thank my colleagues, John Carr and Anna Misla, uh, who have done so much also behind the scenes for this gathering to come together. Let me tell you about two gatherings that we have coming up. Uh, next week, the Papacy Confronts Coronavirus. Um, the Berkeley Center is uh, having a conversation with Paul Eli, um, an author and Berkeley Center senior fellow, and Austin Ivory, a papal biographer, um, who just did this interview with Pope Francis at a Commonweal magazine. Um, and I will be in conversation with them uh, to discuss Pope Francis's insights and approach to his leadership during this Easter season. That's Tuesday, May 5th at 12 p.m. Eastern time. And please go to the Berkeley Center website for more information. We'll also host here at the initiative a dialogue on the global dimensions of the coronavirus crisis on Tuesday, May 12th. Um, that will feature Cardinal Peter Turkson, who is leading Pope Francis's efforts to respond to the global um, crisis that we're all experiencing right now. We'll also have someone from Catholic Relief Services, which is doing so much around the world, and others as well. That is on Tuesday, May 12th uh, at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Um, and most of all, I just want to thank you all for joining us. I hope you're staying well, and I hope you can join us in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>